Are you ready at the back? Can I start? Awesome. So, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to the second room. Um, so I'm Guillaume Memon from Igalia. Uh, so we talk about stuff developed, well, partly on my time at Igalia and partly on my free time as well. Uh, so I'm really thankful for Igalia to leave me working time to work on this as well. Um, and yeah, what was planned was to talk about image stabilization. Um, but you know, it's still quite early in the morning. Um, the beer is very good and very cheap here. So I thought it would be better to, to talk about my holiday pictures. So um, this is the, um, the desert of the Monegros in Spain. Uh, near Zaragoza. Uh, so, well, on the projector it might not be that nice, like the color, the contrasts are a bit weird, but it's really beautiful. So I spent a, w a week there. Um, and yeah, it's sunny and full of dust everywhere. Uh, so, yeah, it's my holiday pictures, but actually the picture is not by me. But I was there. Um, I was there, I uh, came with a friend, uh, Hugo Riboni, who took that picture, and we came with a plan. So I made a drawing to explain the plan. Uh, so the idea was to inflate a balloon with helium, uh, attach a camera to it, attach it to a string, fly it rather high, around 100 meters high, and Take pictures, take pictures from from above of uh, various things happening. There was some kind of hippie festival going on, um, and so we tried to do that. So proof in image. So that's the balloon. So it was rather big because we wanted to carry a camera and all, and to be sure that it stayed more or less still, even with some wind. Um, and so that's what the balloon sees in the kind of configuration of the previous picture. So not that interesting. But um, luckily, the balloon was, you know, a bit like a junkie. He always wanted to get high. So, oh, uh, higher? Okay. You, oh, you, you can see, like, here, like, it's small, like, in white. That's me. You can't really see me anymore. And yeah, that's the maximum altitude we reach. So yeah, the kind of my holiday pictures, the kind of pictures we took was quite nice. Uh, so yeah, we wanted to, so that festival was lasting for a week. We wanted to take pictures for the whole week uh, to like cover the whole event. The balloon only agreed to four and a half. Uh, then after, uh, basically after the first station, it popped. So we had to like bury it. It was very sad. So we had anyway still like four and a half of pictures. Uh, the camera was set to take a picture every minute. So we had some nice pictures. No, no what, what to do with them. So we thought of doing a time lapse. And there should be a video showing here. Okay, never mind. Hold on, sorry for the hiccup. Uh, I can try to show you the video in another way. Or to see what's happening. Ah, all my videos have disappeared. Um, 
I'm sure I can figure that out. That wasn't expected. This work. Why doesn't this work? Okay, since I have experts here, anyone knows what to do when you have that kind of error? <laughs> it says, error connecting, connection refused. Uh, actually, the video doesn't contain any audio stream. But <laughs> it's really resilient. <laughs> doesn't seem to do it. Not the wrong culprit. Yeah, but uh, actually, I tried. I tried to do that, and that works. Okay, uh, but it doesn't work in pinpoint, so my, my talk might get slightly less interactive. Yeah, my plan wasn't to use to them, but pinpoint. Ah, uh, okay. But I will. Aspect is might be related to plugging an external screen on VGA or something. I don't know. It worked before. It worked this morning. Um, it's the totem in uh, the old Ubuntu. 
No, it's old. Ooh, actually I might have a debus problem. Yeah, no, uh, I will do it in a uh Okay, so sorry for the hic sorry for the hiccup. Um I will get to that video. So that's what I wanted to show. Uh, so we want to do a time lapse with with uh, this. So that's an example of a time lapse for those of you who don't know what it is. It's like basically a video where you play the frames faster than uh, the rate at which you took them. So in this example, I think it was like one frame every five minutes, and uh, and we play them at ten frames per second. So it's Accelerated video, basically. So, so the issue with the um, with a time lapse taken from the balloon is that unlike the time lapse you saw just previously, you d you're not on a tripod. You're not on conditions where your camera is always at the same place taking pictures of what you want to take pictures of uh, at the same angle with the same orientation and everything. The camera moves in, like, there is wind, you know? So the camera rotates, moves, and all. So we have the system to make the camera point in the general direction of where the, the balloon was encored on the ground. But then it, well, it would, like, rotate around that, and uh, you could have various movements, like, you have first the camera here, aiming like at my other hand. Then, can you see? Yeah. <laughs> then the wind pushes it here, so it's picture taken from here and moves like this, like that. So if you just try to take the pictures one after the other, it's going to be ugly, just like pure flickering. So we don't want that. So we want to do stabilization in post-processing. Um, yeah, I forgot to say, we don't have a tripod, but we have OpenCV. So, so we want, what we try to do is to use OpenCV to do stabilization in post-processing. So there are two basic steps in that. First, understand the movement, detect that movement, what we call in scientific terms, optical flow. So the optical flow, it's basically the changes of position of features on the images. You can say of pixels, or it can be of objects, or of corners of objects. So yeah, an example here showing, like explaining the pr optical flow of a precise feature, which would be the right hand of that stick figure. Uh, so at the beginning it's at like a, uh, 60, 80, then it moves to the position 80, 
110. So when you're programming things with OpenCV, that's the kind of results that you get. You get like, well, what you try to get is a list of positions on one frame, and then a corresponding list of positions on the next frame, and uh, like each, so the list corresponds to each item on the first list. The item at the same index on the second list is where the what was at the first position on the first frame is on the second frame. Is that clear? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, and then once we have that flow, the idea is to like, s calculate the general modification that happened and apply the like opposite modification. So, so that you move back the frame to a similar position from the previous frame, like content wise. So for compensation, I uh, won't talk too much about that. OpenCV has nice tools to do that. It's like two functions. For at least simple cases, it's rather simple. Uh, I will slightly talk later about other ideas we, uh, that I could try or we could try. But uh, but yeah, it's already quite good, and I haven't investigated that in um, in details. So hold on, video. So this is Joe the hippo. Uh, that's like all the holiday pictures, moving pictures this time. Very moving, as you can see. It was taken from a boat uh, and with a big zoom. It was in South Africa two or three years ago. It was very nice. So here it's see him again, Joe the hippo. So as you can see, there is like some movement. That's it would be could be a good, well. I will use it as an example to try things. So I only tried a few of the algorithms that OpenCV provides, like the ones that seemed uh, the most popular around. Um, so the w first, yeah, there are two two kinds of algorithms. The ones that try to get, maybe show back that nice image, yeah. The ones that try to get the optical flow for every pixel in the frame. So basically for each of the pixels, so you would have like as many entries of pairs of positions as you would have pixels on the frame. So that's the dense optical flow. And then you have spare optical flows that would just like take interest, like find interesting features that are easy to track from one frame to the to the next and only calculate the flow for these. So first an example with a video of Joe the hippo as best as I could try using the the horn trunk algorithm which is dense and well not pretty. It's like the original movement is actually still there and um, you have a lot of flickering on top of that. Uh, also, Hornschung is rather slow. And remember that for that, like it's a VGA resolution image uh, video. I think it could do like maybe maybe two frames per second or something like that, but not like still far from real time. Well, even though by implementations, all the implementations I've done so far, it was like more to try the algorithm, find the right parameters to give to these algorithms. So um, they are, it's overall like not very good performance wise. There are some big operations that I do twice for each frames, whereas I should do them only once. Uh, there are mem copies that happen that aren't really needed, all that kind of things. So anyway, I tried a, spare, a sparse algorithm 
called Lucas Canad. So like Hanshung, uh, both were developed uh, like yeah, in the early 80s. Um, on the, I, by the way, I had all that. Like you can see here the pipeline that I will try to demonstrate. Um, so I, I named my uh, element optical flow corrector. It implements uh, various algorithms. Lucas Canada is number one. Uh, and yeah, that works. So as you can see here, it's not moving anymore which is much better. Um, let's see it again. When I tried it, I think it was slightly faster. On, uh, I think we can reach, uh, at least on that PC, with that algorithm, at least on that PC on for not too big resolutions. Maybe for IG, we're trying to optimize things. We can probably reach a real time almost. Uh, so on that works much better, like Joe was much more stable and happy and you could like, it's really, yeah. You can like pretty much like focus on his eyes, on his beautiful eyes, oh, it's, it's good, it's cool. Yeah, because yeah, baby hippos are always cute. I, I don't know why people are always go with kittens, maybe, maybe just because the baby hippo is slightly bigger. Uh, I think that one probably was like, yeah, it was a small one, a baby, so probably just as big as a cow. Uh, so, yeah, all like Joe the Hippo is a nice fellow. But then what about these pictures that guy talked about at the beginning of the talk? Yeah. Um, so, I wanted to try these algorithms on these kind of pictures. So the big so the big issue compared to well the big difference with uh the case of Joel the Hippo is that the movement between two consecutive frames is much bigger. You could have like one hundred and eighty degrees rotations or that kind of things. So um that's what it looks like with Hornschung. So, a bit of explanation for this picture. That's like uh, a typical visualization that I was using to debug a bit what was happening on the optical flow calculations. So, the less the the less frame. Uh, so, you have two frames, two consecutive frames in the video. The first one on the left, the next one on the right. Uh, on all the lines you can see that are more or less horizontal, all the colorful lines represent one pair of points. That is like the position of a feature on the first frame and the position of the feature on the second frame. Well, as you can see with Hornschung, in that case where you have a big rotation of like 80 degrees, well, almost all the lines are horizontal, which is quite wrong. Like, Consider, I don't know, the lines going from that area at the bottom, say near that black tent. They should go to the black tent here, but they just go somewhere below here. So that's because Hornschung makes the assumption that the movement won't be big between two frames. So with, yeah, Hornschung is dense, is a dense algorithm, so it computed uh, the movement for every pixel, so in the visualization that just like randomly select some points. Lucas Canad only computed the movement for some points that it chose. And, um, well, so you have much less, much fewer lines. They kind of look like they could be better, but if you look in detail, like, well, that one is obvious that it's wrong, like going from that kind of forest on the left that moved to the top, to the top left, but it goes to the bottom left. Or uh, like the lines from this blue tent here should arrive here, but it's arrive right on top of there. So, yeah, not that good. It makes the same kind of assumption, so 
for a case of a time lapse for a balloon doesn't work very well. So the solution, surf, speed it up, robust feature. Um, so it's basically an algorithm um, that there, there are other algorithms of this kind, others that I will try as well, but that I haven't so far. And surf uh, works slightly differently. It's not necessarily meant for motion flow, but can be very useful for that. What it does is um, finds interesting features at various coordinates and give you like the coordinates of a feature on a descriptor for that feature. And that descriptor is invariant with rotation or zoom or a lot of transformations that often happens. So it can be very useful, uh, like OpenCV use it in their example called find obj, so like to find an object. So you, give, you can give to the algorithm a small object, it will give you a list of features and descriptors for them. Then in, a, in another image, you can try to find that object with this by making it find features and descriptors. And then all you have to do so in our case, for both frames, I would ask Surf, give me features and descriptors for these features. Then I compare the descriptors that I have on the two frames. If two descriptors look a lot like each other, it's likely to be the same feature that is described. So that is likely to be the same point in the image, like the same feature, and you can see yeah, it works quite well. Like all the points that he identified over here, and it managed to recognize them over there. Um, oh, sorry, I have big hands. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the points on the town here, they go to the blue tent as well. And all, yeah, all these points seem to match pretty well. And yeah, woohoo, uh, that side is supposed to show you a video of the time lapse working, so uh, I will do it manually. Uh, hold on. Ah. I found how I called the video. <laughs> so, ah, no. Yeah. So that's what it looks like. So you can see even though the original frames had, well, I didn't show you all the frames, but yeah, it would be a bit boring. But I saw you too, and they can be like big rotations and that kind of things. Uh, you can see these rotations through, uh, let's see it again. Through the um, through the, that uh, orange uh, rope that was going down, so you can see that it changes position a lot, but the rest doesn't. Even though on the original frames the orange rope was more or less at the same position, on everything else moved. So yeah, woohoo! Ah. Uh, Ah, yeah, there was a bonus truck video, so I, I feel compelled to show it now. This is asking for it. Uh, yeah, that's just to show that the surf algorithm works with Joe the Hippo as well. Only, well, this time it's, this is pre-computed. So it's not, I'm not trying to do, to do it live, like, uh, with Surf, it's, Surf is much slower than Lucas Cannon. Uh, I think that the best you could do would probably be around maybe five frames per second at VGA on my computer, or that order of magnitude. So, 
I have a long to-do list uh, for the continuation of this project. Uh, so first there's uh, David Jordan, a uh, Google Summer of Code student of Edward, if I'm right, yeah. who, who did a lot of things uh, with optical flow as well. His application is um, to do slow motion videos. So he computes the optical flow between two frames. Uh, and then uh, with that, he, can, he uses that information to compute the intermediate frame and like to create one more frame between the frames so that you can play in slow motion uh, a video that was just shot at a normal frame rate. And uh, so yeah, he, has, he has a fork of uh, GST plugins, but somewhere, and he has an element that finds the optical flow and does that kind of thing. And ideally, yeah, I could, well, I should try to work with him and to like kind of unify and have at least a common interface for things that find op an optical flow. So for the compensation, uh, as you could see on, where is it? Ah, I lost the presentation. <laughs> okay, woohoo. It's, oh, no. Where's my video gun? Okay, in this video, you can see that it doesn't look always very pretty in the edges for two reasons. First, because you have the black borders moving. But secondly, if you, if you look, and the areas that are like kind of round, the rounded corners, um, you can see that there is a kind of wobbly effect on, that goes even well with less uh, uh, with less impact towards the center. Uh, that's because the objective uh, of the camera is not perfect; it was a wide-angle objective, so there there is deformation on the edges, and if you have features that move. Uh, from the edges to the center or the opposite, like the deformations won't be the same or won't be as big. Uh, so it could be interesting to try to fine tune the compensation according to, uh, like, measure the movement in each of these smaller areas and do a compensation accordingly to try to, like, instead to map from a plane to a plane, map from a plane to something else. <laughs> so and yeah, I want to try more algorithms. Uh, like uh, OpenCV just added a uh, brief on ORB, which are algorithms of the same kind of surf that like find features on descriptors. Uh, the ideal ground goal uh, would be to have an element that could just automatically, automatically compensate these movements you don't want in a video. And depending on the video on the stream, you might want to use one algorithm or the other, and you want probably different parameters for the algorithm. And if we manage to figure out from the video stream, try to find some heuristics or something to to find like what what algorithm would work best and with what parameters, uh, that would be like awesome. Uh, maybe in the long run, re-implement those things in C to avoid some uh, mem copies that they do that due to to the OpenCV interface in Python. So, like uh, to manipulate the buffer in OpenCV, I have to create like an OpenCV image, and uh, I cannot always exactly take the data from the buffer. So, I often have to mem copy that. And um, yeah, uh, another thing is that uh, all the examples you saw were like videos of something like videos looking at the same points uh, for the whole time, so at the same subject. Uh, but uh, it would be good if we could handle panning and that kind of thing. So trying to understand the 
general movement that the cameraman actually wanted and to follow that movement while removing the shaking. Uh, there, there are, I think there are some stuff in OpenCV that can be very helpful for that. It probably wouldn't be too hard to implement. So, that's it. Any questions? Okay, so the question is, how does the algorithm, uh, I guess he was talking about serve because it was the only one that wasn't working, so how does the algorithm knows that uh, the rope uh, was not part of the like, active thing that, that you want? Well, actually, in OpenCV you can, what I thought of doing initially was uh, first doing it quite rough, just like considering the rope was always in the same area, uh, like just having a stupid mask that would be like the global area where the rope was and tell it like, don't try to find points there. Um, but, uh, and then to, to make it more evaluate, we could do like contour detection, like detect the shape of the rope or something, or even use surf to detect the points of the rope to, see, to know where the rope is and remove it. Um, but it turns out that I didn't need that. Uh, magically, the algorithm didn't consider the rope. I think that it's because it's slightly out of focus and the points get less interesting, but I'm not totally certain of that. But that's my assumption so far. I like didn't look into that into details. It was magically working, that's all I needed. Yeah, uh, the suggestion was, sorry. I'm just trying to repeat what you say in B before I forget everything. So the suggestion was to use, uh, I guess, surf to like get the descriptors of the rope and like find them with that to know what to eliminate. Um, yeah, it's a good idea. But yeah, as I said, the, in that case, it wasn't needed. But in a case where you would have had the rope in focus or an annoying object, yeah, that could be a good idea. Uh, okay, so Thomas is wondering if uh, it could work better if we could like have a better idea of the movements of the camera by taking pictures uh, more frequently. Um, well, to the I say, if you take them frequently enough, like basically take a video at 25 frames per per second or something like that. Uh, yes, definitely. Like, and you could use horn chung or something like that. Um, or yeah, it could be an idea if you want to like then accelerate that video, but not have to stabilize the whole video stream to yeah, like use that movement information, like just calculate the movement information that we got from that. Uh, even though calculating the move the the movement is the costly operation. So it, it, it uh, depends, well, there is a limit probably, but if you, if you have 25 frames per second and end up only using one frame every second, doing just one surf run for two images would be much faster than, say, a Lucas Canad run for 25 images. Yes? Since it's a video, since you're applying it to the previous video, it 
themselves would be doing in that place and in the following place will be pretty impressive, which is how you can build on your service. And those are really fast, but they're not generic services other than like the ones that you're using in the next two weeks. Excellent. It's like Yeah. So, straight summary: uh, the the comments that were given. So, uh, what was noted by, um, by Edward is uh, that you have um, algorithm used in video uh, in video coding uh, that are that detect motion as well, but they are like specialized for this. Right, uh, and they and they are not general purpose. Probably couldn't be used for that. Uh, even though I'm wondering, do you think they could be used uh, for for video for like motion compensation in a video stream that is continuous? Okay, so people try to do that using uh, EPZS, what is called the like commonly used algorithm in video compression, and um, it was kind of almost working sometimes. Is that it? So the question is whether this kind of algorithm, if I understood the question correctly, is whether these uh, algorithm that generally work on blocks, right, and not like just on features or on pixels, uh, whether these could be useful, knowing that some can track rotations as well and can track a lot of things. Um, so my answer is I don't know. Uh, from what Edward just say, I guess that it can maybe kind of work. I guess probably some more research, some more tries can be done with that. But yeah, because I guess these are already have like very fast implementations, including implementations in hardware. So if you could extract information from what they do, that yeah could be very interesting. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the question is if I have tried to chain different corrections, like first doing one correction with SURF, for instance, and then using another algorithm to refine the compensations. Uh, I think that I tried that at some point, but uh, it didn't really improve the results. Because like, what I get from SURF there is probably the best I could get. Um, 
the the things that could improve the 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 final video stream would be uh, first to so either like find a way to flatten these videos because they are taken with a wide angle objective, so there are videos that are images that are kind of round. So well, first they are round on, in the projection, but they so they represent objects that are like more at the edge. So uh, there there are some algorithms and something to like flatten images to do as if you have the perfect objective. And if you had these kind of images. Uh, so we would have much uh, less weird movements of magical movements of objects between frames, and also we could. Uh, I think the other big improvement on that uh, would be to um, to like basically display. The, uh, once you have that, so a precise image, you could display uh, your new frame on top of the previous one, so that you don't have black areas, but instead you see the content of the previous frame, which would quite match what was previously, and that probably would look much smoother. Yeah? So you mean put markers on what you're taking pictures of? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So his suggestion is to uh, find some hippies uh, who don't move and paint them is recognizable. Oh yeah, or attend. Yeah. Uh, so put some markers in in like four markers uh, that are like around the place and like recognize these markers easily because they have a recognizable color or something or recognizable shapes and use that to calculate the transformation. Um, uh, yes, that would definitely be doable and that I think could allow to do that uh, rather easily in real time. Because in the end with surf, what you end up is having markers, but much more complicated markers, and that are like take much more time to find. But with um, yeah, if you if you add markers with specific colors, you could just like look for these colors and yeah, be very fast. That's actually what I thought of doing initially, but uh, then I got lazy about. Building things, or no? You know, we were already like very busy with the balloon. So I said, "Ah, oh, I fix it in software. It's easy." <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> oh. All right. I guess it means we're nearing the end. So, thank you. You can find uh, the code of the first URI. Uh, the history of the balloon, the balloon project at large on the second URI, that's then my blog, my email, the, the website of Igalia. And, well, hope to see you all around the drink, maybe a beer.